Hi, my name is Dawn Rodriguez, and I've been asked to speak at the Murphy Family Tree Spaghetti Supper in Lancaster, Ontario. I've been diagnosed with Murphy's Syndrome at the age of four years old, and this was back in 1975. At that time, the doctors and specialists did not know anything essentially to treat Murphy's Syndrome. As the symptoms happen, when children were losing the ability to walk because their legs were getting crooked, having knock need, and uh, spine instability, and cardio problems, cardiovascular problems, such as heart murmur, um, mitral valve regurgitation, and things like that, um, as part of the, the whole problem with uh, Marchio, um, doctors didn't know what else to do to correct it except the symptoms as they happened. Now mind you, I was four years old and the doctors told my family that I would not live long enough to reach my 10th birthday. So that was not a very good day at the doctors for my parents. I was sh sheltered to an extent as to what I, how I was sick and what caused it and stuff. But I did ask questions and that was when my parents answered for me. They answered the questions I had. As well as me being curious as I was, I wanted to know why I was so little, why I couldn't run as fast, and things like that. How you see me today with my crooked hands and my arms and my short body, that is not how I look like as a child. And Murphy syndrome is an enzyme deficiency. And so, because of it, I'm not able to metabolize the essential um, chemical waste that normal people, healthy people who are undiagnosed, uh, non-diagnosed morphio, um, are able to do on a daily basis because it's a part of their cell genetic makeup. I'm missing an enzyme, and some, you know, enzymes can give you your... Um, brown hair. It could give you a freckle that is just like Grandpa Joe or a dimple that looks like your mom's. So anything like that that is inherited, whether it's eye color or hair color and things like that, I do not have the key to open and unlock the door. And so because of that, the chemical waste of the uh, body that I'm not able to metabolize and get rid of. I actually store it. Um, people with Morgia syndrome store the chemicals that cause problems for us later in life as it is a progressive and deteriorating condition. Okay, so when I was able to stand and walk and have perfectly straight legs, even though I was just little, um, my sisters, who are a year, two and a half years younger than I, they continued to grow and get taller, and I stayed pretty much the same height. The last time that I was taller than my sisters, half-sisters, I was about five years old. And I still am only pretty much that same height. I was 21 and three-quarter inches long at birth, and I was 8 pounds, 15 ounces. So just one more ounce, and I would have been a full 9-pound baby. And right now, I am 42 inches tall, so just a meter tall. And I have been able to continue in my life because I have my parents who essentially guided me and loved me enough to say, I can do things. It may not be the same um, quickness, and it may not be in the time frame that I want it done compared to my friends, but I'll get it done. I was able to go to public school. In 1977, the United States of America had passed a law that made it mandatory for children of special needs to go to public school. The year before I began school, it was not available. So, in my elementary school, 
I was one of two children that was considered special needs. The other little boy with me was about a grade or two older, higher than I, and he was blind. He was actually legally blind. And then me, who was um, six years old, because of my birthday cut off, I had to start a year later, um, probably, you know, not even a meter tall at that point. I believe I was two feet tall and about 35 pounds. So very small in a big wide world. And I did it. I went through all my public schooling in my area schools. And if I was one of three, if I was one of ten, but we were all able to attend public school. The thing with Morgia syndrome is that it affects your body, all your muscular, skeletal, your cardiovascular, your organs, your eyesight, your hearing, and everything. But it does not diminish your mental capacity, your intelligence, and your desire to do things in your life. I have a hope. I had hope growing up. And that is why I continue to participate in studies and offer my information to doctors and to researchers in the hopes that we could get a treatment and one day a cure. If it wasn't for me to have a cure or a treatment, it was my hope that the younger generation would be able to live a long life and do things that they would like to do. I graduated in the top 25 percentile of my school in a class of 800 students. I was able to go to college and I wanted so dearly to go to college because as you can see, cheerleading and uh, you know, lumberjacking and uh, Anything physical that was going to be a little bit out of my league, but I definitely could keep up with the masses in school and at doing the job right. So I was able to attend Purdue University, North Central Campus in Indiana. I was accepted at another college, a private school in Indiana. But because of finances, my family and I were unable for me to attend it. But I did go to Purdue University for my underclass studies. And as it got to be too cold in Indiana, I wanted to come back to Texas where I was raised, where the weather's a little easier and warmer on the bones. And I continued my schooling and I actually graduated from the University of Texas in San Antonio in 2004 with a degree in psychology. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology. And I, mind you, I began college in 1990. And I did not uh, graduate college until 2004. It took me 14 years, but I did it. And my grandmother, who was my cheerleader and my advocate, she always encouraged me. And even on her deathbed in 2001, she said, Dawn, whatever happens, I want you to continue. And I want you to get that degree because you earned it and you deserve it. You worked hard for it. So, I did graduate, and despite my multiple surgeries and things like that, I had setbacks because of those surgeries. I did graduate college. I was able to even become a teacher's assistant and be in charge of 20 students in a classroom. I absolutely loved it, and I was there for four years as a teacher. My students were kindergartners, 
first graders and second graders. And it was the best because when I first became a teacher in that environment, I was actually a little worried because I was giving the kids a double whammy. Not only was I most likely the first person that they ever saw in a wheelchair, but I was probably the first little person that they had ever seen as well. It could be a little bit overwhelming for the little ones to see and make out, exactly figure out who I was and why was I being so lofty and telling them we had to study or if it was time to go to the playground and play. And so, I knew I had made a, uh, an impression on the kids because when we would go to field trips and walk around in the public, not just in the school, the kids always wanted to hold my hand. They, you know, how they do the study system. Grab the hand of a buddy and then we're going to walk together, whether it's going to be across the street or going to down the hall to the, another classroom or going to the cafeteria and stuff like that. We always had to have a buddy system with the little ones. And they would love to help Miss Dawn. They wanted to be my assistant for the day and hold the doors and make sure that everybody was also following in the line. And we came in contact with the public, with parents who were probably as curious as they had been when they first met me, uh, the children had met me, about who I was and what was I doing, that they just accepted me after knowing that I was their teacher. Um, the kids, it was unbelievable in that in the beginning of the school year, they might have been a little bit timid and afraid. And they saw people noticing me and maybe thinking I was a little weird. And they didn't like that. And I thought it was the most fantastic feeling when the kids are looking at the other people who are supposed to be adults and accepting and knowing. And they were strangely looking at me like, what is this little woman doing? And the kids said, golly, Miss John, look, haven't they ever seen a person in a wheelchair before? Golly, you know, why do they keep staring at you, Miss Dahl? And I knew I had the kids in that moment that they accepted me. And then, being that they were so young, they could go on and accept other people as well. But most amazing moment was when one of my students, little Jacob, he had asked me curiously, Miss Dawn, are, are you a grown-up? Are you a little kid like me? Because he wondered, why was I being so bossy? <laughs> and I just loved it. He accepted me, and I just told him, I'm just little, so that way, when we talk to each other, you don't have to crane your head, and I could be right here, eye to eye with you and get your full attention, and you could ask me anything you need to me of me, and I'll help you, because I'm your teacher. And he got it. He got it, and that was amazing. Um, I've had six spine fusions, and I've had one wrist fusion, where I actually do not have one of the bones in my arm, from the elbow to the wrist. Um, it was in 2011 that my radial bone decided to dislocate. And the only right now, because of my fusion surgery that I have, you can see a scar right here, um, the rod is the only thing that's connecting my hand to my arm. Uh, I have tremendous carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, I do wear hand splints and I've had injections for uh, carpal tunnel uh, injections of cortisone. Um, I have hope. I always have had hope. But on a daily basis, it is a very hard grind to deal with sometimes. Um, 
pain-wise, um, I have a very high threshold to pain. Um, as a child, I didn't ever even want to take baby aspirin. And it was only when I was asking my mom, my grandmother, Mommy, I don't hurt. I hurt and I, I, I need an aspirin. Um, I hurt too bad. And it was only then that she knew it was really bad because I never wanted to ask for any kind of pain reliever. Um, I still the same way. Um, even at my old age, I, I don't want to be on medications and things that kind of make me groggy and, and, you know, enjoy things around me, my environment. But when it gets to a point that it hurts to even just lay in bed and you have an hour just laying there to decide, well, I guess I better get up out of bed because it's, it's pointless. It's always going to be there, the pain. Um, I am now on a, on a uh, pain patch only for the past two months. And for me, it's such a godsend to have that available to me. Um, I'm hoping I'm in the process of getting venison enzyme replacement therapy at my local hospital. I have never been on it before, but I know that my morgia will never um, go retro, you know, back to where when I was able to run and walk and, and do those things. My fingers won't miraculously straighten out and I won't have a swan neck finger. Uh, but my quality of life will be there, where I don't have to just sit in pain. Um, I worry about the younger generation as to um, not having the support that they, ha they have, um, whether it's family, friends, um, things like that, that somehow they're so isolated. I mean, we have social media, which is wonderful, and we get to uh, talk to people and things, but because of that, we're also able to stay at home and isolate ourselves from the outside world and not actually get out and go and do and be. I, I worry about the kids that they're not able to cope. And so, <sighs> The Morpheus Syndrome is not all that defines me, who I am, but I feel that because of my diagnosis, it's helped me try to be a stronger person. It, um, I hear people so many times say that I'm an inspiration to them, and it's very nice, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll say thank you, but I'm just doing it just as everybody else. You know, I, I've been given this situation, and you make lemonade, you know, what do you got when you have lemons? So, I mean, you make lemonade, and you sit and pucker and cry. So, you know, you have to do something with what you have. And so this is what was given to me um, through no choice of my own, but you have to do what you have to do. Um, and that. I mean, if we have only one life to live, I would like to be happy. I'd love to have friends around me and to not have pain, um, the physical pain. Um, emotional pain you can deal with, that's just no biggie. Um, at least, you know, I, I think it would be for me, but the physical pain is such a, such a great instance that it was absolutely wonderful when I got the news February 14, 2014, Valentine's Day, that the FDA has approved venison and that replacement therapy. I never thought that I would see that in my lifetime. And now that it's possible that I could actually get the therapy, and hopefully, you know, enjoy the benefits of it where the progression will stop or it will lessen and to such a degree that 
I'll hopefully live a little bit longer and be able to enjoy things in my life a lot better. And I think the whole thing about it, too, is that not only thinking about myself, you know, I have an opportunity to have business in. I have the ERT infusion, um, but it's dangling in front of me. You know, if you have a hunger or a desire for something, a hope for something that could help you or someone you love, and it's dangling just out of reach. You have a hope to please someone. Help. Help me. Help my family member. Help my friend. That they could be treated and have the opportunity as everyone else. Um, it's not, so, I don't think it's a nice thing that when there is a treatment now, it's been 39 years that I've waited. Um, if it happens for me, I'm, I'd be ecstatic. If it continues on to help other people in Canada, in England, in Germany, and Mexico, and Venezuela, and Ireland, and every country in the world that has been touched by Morkio, whether it's just the one diagnosed person, or if they have, you know, 50 in the country, I hope that everyone is able to get this. And the younger the, ch the person, you know, two years old, ten years old, twenty years old, however, the progression would be such an extent that they're able to walk, they're able to do everything. And it would be phenomenal that they could have their life not be cut down because of the Markia. And I would hope that legislation and everything in countries would approve it. And it seems that for us with, with uh, Morkio, it's a little slow because we don't have a lot of time or it's a little condensed. And uh, so I would hope it would, it would get passed. Um, for the family of Angel, La France Bourgeon, for Melanie and for Aiden, and for Janine, and all my friends, my Canadian friends, as well as other people in America and, and the rest of the world, I would hope that they could also have their treatment if they so desire on a personal level. It's almost like, um, that's the mindset that you have insulin available for diabetics, but you're not going to give it to them. And so their body deteriorates. And it's, it's in with your, your grasp of helping so many family members, so many families, to enjoy life. And I hope that could be possible for everybody. The... Uh, the surgeries that I've had, and I've had my spine. I'm actually an occipital thoracic fusion. For since 2000, I have not been able to move my head. I'm only able to move my upper arms and my legs, and at my waist, at the lumbar twisting. But if someone was to ask me to turn to look behind me. I would have to turn on my wheelchair and turn the chair or turn this way because my spine has been um, damaged to such an extent that it's unstable and had to be fused with 
the rods and um, also donor bone grafting. And so I'm unable to move my head. And it's, it's not the end of the world, but it's definitely different. And only being able to move my eyes as well as my jaw um, and the upper body level, I should say. Um, it's not the end of the world, and it's, and it's, you know, you make do, but if it's somehow that people learn from me that you can still enjoy life, I hope that that's what they get out of it. Um, me going to school, to graduate college, to be a teacher, um, I was in retail even, and, and this is the amazing thing. I have a uh, handmaid, and I was hired by a store to be a phone operator. So I was saying thank you for calling, how am I direct your phone call, and, it's, uh, and also working with management with my own little radio walkie-talkie. And I just think it's so amazing that a hearing impaired person is a phone operator. It's absolutely amazing, and it's just such a great um, notion of acceptance. You know, it's just amazing. Um, but again, it's like you know, my body isn't up to par, or it's slowing down with what my mind, with what my mind wants it to do. Um, everything is on a slower, slower spiel, so to speak, and. I just hope that, again, Remnants and ERC is available to my Canadian friends. And, uh, please talk about that. And please know that they appreciate your help in getting it done. And uh, I as well, because they're good people, good friends of mine. And I like to have them a little bit longer, a lot longer. And uh, enjoy the life. So I know I've been long with this in my speech, but thank you again, Morfield Family Tree in Lancaster, Ontario, for asking me to be a speaker at your Spadotic Supper. And thank you. I always like to say that. It's not the years in your life that count, but the life in your years that do. Thank you.